Hi, and welcome to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. I am your host, Steve Bissam. I'm an author and mental health counselor. Are you curious about therapy? Do you feel there is a lot of mystery about therapy? Do you wonder what your therapist is doing and why? The goal of this podcast is to make therapy and psychology accessible to all by using real language and straight-to-the-point discussions. This podcast wants to remind you to take care of your mental health, just like you would your physical health. Therapy should not be intimidating. It should be a great way to better health. I will demystify what happens in counseling, discuss topics related to mental health, and discussions you can have with your therapist. I also want to introduce psychology in everyday life, as I feel most of our lives are enmeshed in psychology. I want to introduce the subtle and not-so-subtle ways psychology plays a factor in our lives. It will be my own mix of thoughts as well as special guests. So join me on this discovery of therapy and psychology. Hi, and welcome to season four. Yes, season four of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. I am Steve Bisson. On episode 40, returning guests, Sergeant Jay Ball from the Framingham, Massachusetts Police Department. Jay has been on every single season. Very happy to have him back. And Caitlin Dehe, she's the lead clinician at Westboro Behavioral Health Services. She's also a returning guest. Very happy to have her back, too. It was interesting. A couple of weeks ago, I was like, hey, what are we going to talk about in this podcast episode? And Jay, who happens to also be someone who served in the Army for several years, wanted to talk about the current situation in Ukraine, and not in a political way. He was very clear about that. And he wanted to talk about the effects that it has on veterans and veterans issues, as well as people who are possibly going up there and wanted to really just have a chat about that. And Jay doesn't typically talk to me about any of this stuff. And I I think that he's really been affected by it. So I'm like, hey, let's go with it. So very happy to do that. Caitlin obviously agreed. And Caitlin is someone who has a lot of insight because a lot of first responders also are former military personnel. So I think that what she's going to bring into is going to be very interesting. And obviously I have my point of view, so I'll bring that in too. So please enjoy the episode. Hi everyone. Welcome to episode 40. Yes. Season four, first episode. That's going to be, uh, it's, I can't believe I got four seasons out of this. I'm having again, a returning guest. He's usually the first episode of every season. And last time Caitlin was so popular, we brought Caitlin back, Caitlin Dehe and Jay Ball, Sergeant Jay Ball, and we've talked about a lot of first responder stuff. And Jay, I got to start off by kind of busting your balls a little bit. You know, you were the most popular episode in the first season, and since then, nothing yet. And I'm a little concerned about that because you know you're you're here to like drive my ratings, and it's ain't, it ain't working. Uh, mo- much like the rest of my life, I peaked too early, so uh, <laughs> hopefully it goes up from here, though. Well. Um, I, I'll tell you that I'm I'm expecting like you're the the highest download overall. You still are. I, I'll give you that. But you know, after that, it's just been going down. So, Caitlin, I we brought you on. I thought you're going to bring us up too. I'm hoping you can bring up some stuff. See what I can do. I know you started off kind of laughing, but we're about uh, I want to say 16 days roughly after the start of Russia invading Ukraine, and Jay, who served in the army, not the Air Force. This is an old joke between me and him. One day we'll explain it. I know that this has been so triggering. I, I've seen it like I see first responders, and obviously first responders have a lot of military background, and it's been very hard for a whole lot of them. And you know, when I was talking to Jane Caitlin right before we started bouncing ideas for ep- this episode, Jay said, "No, I want to talk more about you know the experience of veterans, military personnel, people who came back." and how that affects them. So, you know, Jay, I know that I know a little bit about your background around that, but can you share a little more about, you know, I, I said it, but how long did you serve and it, it, did you go anywhere and stuff like that? Yeah, I was in the army uh, active duty wise from 95 to 99. I was lucky. I remember when I signed up, I was lucky enough to get a good score in the ASVAB. I got to choose my job. I was stupid. I chose artillery. Because they show you these cool videos and these things blowing up everywhere. And you're like, at 18, you're like, I want to do that. So I got to pick my job. And then uh, they said, geez, you can pick your duty station too. And they said, you can pick this, 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 or this. And uh, one of the choices was Germany. And in my mind, uh, being an 18 year old kid from Lawrence, Massachusetts, going to Germany was a no brainer. I was like, sign me up. So I went to Fort Sill right off, went to basic training, AIT, Fort Sill. And then right after that, I went to, uh, 
place called Schweinfurt, Germany, Ledwood Barracks, which is in uh, the outskirts of Bavaria. It's uh, about an hour and a half southeast of Frankfurt. And while you were out there, did you end up going to any like combat zones of any kind? Well, according to the United States government, it wasn't a combat zone. But uh, in 1995, they signed the Date Peace Accord. There was a war going on in uh, the Balkans, uh, specifically Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I want to, like, when we decided to plan this, we were talking, we're leaving politics out of this. So uh, two things. One, I'm leaving politics out of this. And two, this is my own thoughts and beliefs, not based off my employment. So I just want to get that out of the way employment currently. So went to Bosnia. It was a war-torn country at the time. This was 1996. Uh, war-torn country. There was The fighting had stopped because they signed that piece of paper in Dayton, Ohio. But there were still the warring factions. I was in a place called Doughboy, uh, D-O-B-O-J. And they called it the Doughboy Fingers because what happened was there was a zone of separation. And much like, uh, and I don't want to compare it to Korea, but much like Korea, it was an area that the warring factions were separated. And I could name the warring factions off. And you would think, oh, geez, well, these people may have been at fault. Well, these people are probably not at fault, but everyone was at fault, in my opinion. You know, the Serbians, uh, Croats, and uh, groups of Muslims. And, and that's how they were broken up. And it, it's funny because uh, stereotypically, I, I'm not going to point out a group, but one person would point out a group and say, oh, geez, they must have been the aggressors. I was stationed with the North Pole Brigade, which we were a small faction of Americans with uh, the Swedes, the Danes, the Finns. Down the street were the Polish and the Lithuanians. We were small, like I said, small uh, contingency of Americans. And we were on a peacekeeping mission. Uh, we fell under the United Nations, not as the blue helmets that you would see, but we fell under the United Nations and NATO. When we first got there, we were called S4. We were a stabilizing force. While we were there, we did something which was called a reflag to I-4, which was an implementation force. So we stabilized the Dayton Peace Accord, made sure the warring factions stayed away from each other. We were taught one phrase, Stani Ali Putsam, I'll never forget it, stop or I'll shoot. That was basically the what we learned. And we also had a row card, which many people in the military understand what a row is, ROE, rules of engagement. Don't fire unless fired upon. And we were there for peacekeeping. Uh, were there little skirmishes here and there? Yes. Did a lot of people want to see us there? No, in my opinion at the time, especially the Serbians. I remember crossing into uh, Slavonsky Brod from into Bosnia, into Slavonsky Brod, one of the first places in Bosnia. And little kids, which I appeared, and Steve knows this, what appeared uh, seemed like they were giving us the peace sign. But uh, without, you know, yeah. obviously, we're on the we're not on TV. I can't show you. But it's two fingers that were up, and it looks like that. But the third finger, the ring finger, I would say, on the right hand, is slightly extended. And it had to do with support for um, the Serbians. And once again, I'm not picking sides. I'm uh, just from my experiences, what happened coming in. Uh, you saw the atrocities in Birchko, the massacres in Srebrenica. You saw our snipers in Sarajevo. Uh, and we were coming in to make sure that that piece that was signed in 95, like I said, it was there in 96 and uh, 97, was stabilized, made sure weapons, casters were destroyed. But we were going into a country that was uh, in war for years. And you could say years going back into the early 90s. But if you want to go into history and study a little bit of history on it, you can go all the way back to, and you can look it up, Prince Lazar back in the uh, 7th century. Uh, and then obviously we know how the World War I started. Same area with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So this is an area of the world that has been a power keg for years. And people can blame it on nationalities, people can blame it on religion, but at the end of the day, we were there and we were there to keep the peace. Um, so that's uh, the, 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 the semi-long story of it going into Bosnia. Oh, no, I needed the long story. And, you know, I was laughing when you said you were in the blue helmets, you know, that's Canadians usually. And I know that <laughs> you, you always strive to be Canadian after all. So that's why I think you mentioned yeah. that. No blue helmet on me though. No, never. <laughs> <laughs> Well, none on mine either. I've never served. So, hey, <laughs> you know, Caitlin, I want to throw you in a little bit here and talk about, you know, like this is stuff that when you work with veterans, you work with first responders and obviously you work with both. 
No, I give you give you a lot of credit, Jay. Thank you for sharing so much. I've known you for 21 years, but I've never asked you once for these stories. And I appreciate know it's knowing you even more. I knew about the three fingers. I knew about that. But Caitlin, when you talk to veterans, to first responders, do you get that kind of sense of like, I almost feel like unfinished business basically from them on a general basis? Yeah, I think it depends on which you know, which place they went, which war they participated in. Um, I think there's different levels of that. I think particularly in the, you know, the war Jay was in, I think that, or, you know, that war torn area, I think a lot of the veterans that were over there have similar feelings about unfinished business and, and are having a lot of like feelings brought up right now about that because of what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, it's bringing up things for a lot of people, not just veterans and and that population, you know, people who maybe have like come to the U S from war torn countries themselves and saw their family members being taken by soldiers of an an invading country. You know, that's, and now they're here as adults in the U.S. And this is bringing up a lot of stuff for them as well. I think it's a really big thing that's happening and having a big impact on a lot of people right now. And I know that for me, what, one of my biggest pet peeves recently has been hearing that this is the first invasion since the Second World War. Hell no. And I'm just sick of hearing that. I, I yeah. personally know that my guys are really affected by that because I'm like, yeah, we can name several others between 1939 and 2021. And I think that that there's a lot of this stuff that really triggers a lot of people. And one of the things that comes to mind, Jay, if you want to continue talking about your experience in Bosnia, that's great. But the first thing that comes to mind, staying more like 2021-ish, 2022, is how much my military guys were kind of screwed up about when we left Afghanistan and how we did it. And again, there's no politics here. There's no of views. This is not my LMHC on the on the board. Same thing for you, Caitlin. It's not your, mm-hmm. you're not a sergeant here, uh, Jay. But you know, one of the things that I really felt from everyone around that time is that we were there for 20 years. We helped so many things, and then we just up and left and screwed up so many things that we had worked hard for. Jay, Jay or Caitlin, and I, I'll let you both do it. But is that something that's similar for a lot of people, or am I? Am I getting all the outliers? And thank you, Jay, for that word. <laughs> the first thing I, I, I think of is a lot of the guys, and I'm not putting them on the spot, but a lot of the guys I work with and a lot of people I know a little bit younger than me and, and my age also, but uh, they were in Afghanistan. They were in Iraq the second time around. And I remember reaching out to them when things were starting to unfold with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And it's hard for me not to touch into politics about it because it has a lot to do with it. But looking at the way it was done, and, and you know, I'm not struggling for words here, but I remember talking to some guys and they're like, well, why did why did so-and-so die there? Why did so-and-so get maimed there? Why did so-and-so this happen to them there? For us to just pick up and leave. Uh, and I'm not saying 20 years needed to be spent there. But at the here and now of uh, being pulled out and everything just leaving, that affected a lot. And I know, Steve, I think you you mentioned it too with maybe some clients, but I know that affected some of of the guys I know. Not debilitating by any means, but I know it was in the back of their minds. I know they wanted to talk about it. Um, I know some people struggled with it, especially those that lost close, close members of their units, close family members. You see a lot of movies that have come out about Afghanistan. Um, I was not there. Have I done a little bit of research on it? Yep. Once again, I was not there. I've heard a lot from guys. It was It's a treacherous environment. The things that those men and women had to do in Afghanistan, it, it isn't uh, you know a point blank thing. There's mountains and the terrain and everything they had to go with being surrounded by enemy forces. People, are they an enemy? Are they not an enemy? Just like in Iraq. You know, is this little kid pose a threat? Does this little kid not pose a threat? Some countries and some warring factions don't don't conduct war the same way we do. I'm not saying that the United States is uh, perfect. We are far from perfect. Our military is far from perfect. But we tend on 
to, to play by the rules. And uh, we put a lot of men and women, women over in forward areas, Afghanistan and Iraq to be specific. And they were, they were put in predicaments that their lives were in danger, but then coming home, their psychological well-being, for lack of a better term, was also in danger. Yeah, I think I've heard a lot of that same stuff from people like what we were there for all that time for. We like so many lives, you know, of our friends and our service, like our fellow service members were were taken. And for what? Like for it all to just like what why did we do all of this? And I think that when you're talking about 20 years of what Jay just sort of described of like people being over there and going for multiple tours, I mean, tour after tour and being in the difficult terrain and not knowing, you know, if the little kid who looks so innocent is an innocent little kid or somebody that has got an explosive strapped to them. Like there's so many things that were difficult for people to see while they were over there. So many atrocities that they saw and then losing people on top of it. And that went on for so long for so many people that, And then to have it just be ended the way it was ended, like just makes people feel like, what did I, what was my purpose there? You know, I think it takes away the sense of meaning for people. And I think a sense of meaning is something I'm always talking about in groups and sessions with clients because it's an important part of life for everyone. And I feel like the way that that all went down, it, for a lot of people I've talked to, it, it took away that sense of, of purpose that they spent all that time and then just sort of all fell apart. Yeah. And another thing, just going back. So with this current, I'll, I'll use the term war because it is war. With this current war, different things affect different people. And one thing that I notice and I say when we, uh, when Caitlin and I teach mental health first aid or some other uh, classes that I've taught, I bring up children, a lot a lot of problems with what I have going on with myself from my past that I never recognized was was children. And watching, listen, I could watch the TV all day long. War is war. I'm going to say this and people are going to be shocked. People die. It's horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous. I see people watching that have never been in the military and no discredit to them. And they're watching what they see on TV, whether they believe things or what propaganda is out there, whatnot. They're seeing a war. To myself and some other people I've talked to that are in the military, that's not the shocking part. Uh, the shocking part is two things that, that jump out at me. One, what this can turn into and knowing the capabilities of uh, nuclear powers, not the scary one, knowing the capabilities of cyber attacks, knowing the capabilities of EMPs. These are all things that when I watch the television, I see war happening and it People are going to be like, oh my, I can't believe he said this. But it, it, to me and to other veterans that I've spoken to, it is what it is. It's horrible. It's horrendous. And the second thing, getting back to the children, and I got an argument, not an argument. I kind of got told to stop it. But um, I wanted to go, as silly as it sounds, I wanted to go to the, the Polish border. I wanted to protect the children coming across. I could get emotional, so don't blame me. But just from things in Bosnia, seeing the the kids come across the borders with one toy and like no food that really, really affects me. So, so everything affects people the same different ways, you know, maybe the combat, maybe refugees, (laughs) it's all what, what affects you inside. Well, you know, one of the things that touching base on a few things that you said and trying to bring you back a little bit here no one joins the armed forces to not help, you know, at at least I can only speak intelligently about two countries here, uh, Canada and the U S and you want to help those kids. You want to help the people there, liberate them or help them or whatever. This is a little bit of what happens also with first responders. Right. And then that's what they do. They don't choose these jobs to be confronted with these harsh realities, even though they, the, the sh- thing I ever hear is people like, well, you signed up for this. It, it, no, you didn't sign up for that. I want to <laughs> punch people when they say that. Mm-hmm. I think that from my perspective, what I'm hearing from you, Jane, thank you for being so that way. You know, for me, it's watching that stuff that's been very difficult for me. I've never been in those situations, but watching these trains being 
unloaded in Poland and these kids with like their one rag doll, they're tired, they haven't sp- slept in 44 hours. And you're talking about food. I just talk about, you know, again, maybe it's my own bias, but the mental health part that goes with that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you've got kids that are being displaced. And I'm, I'm not discounting a, a adults by any means, but you've got little kids who should be at school, should be playing in playgrounds, playing different things, being dragged out of the homes at a moment's notice and fighting to get on train. You know, and we don't see everything. We see kids crossing the border and think it's horrible. We see, I, I saw a nice picture the other day of a lot of Polish families putting um, strollers, just leaving them unattended at the border for them coming across so um, some of the Ukrainian refugees could get them. And once again, I'm not picking sides. I'm not picking anything, but obviously there's numbers of people being displaced right now, and it's it's Ukrainian citizens and the citizens that don't have a, a stake in this. They've been forced out of their homes. So it's similar to, to in Bosnia. There were a lot of displaced people. Uh, a lot of the people we met through our translators, they weren't living in the homes they grew up in or they were moved. And just looking in their eyes, they, you know, say a five-year-old, the five-year-old's eyes should be happy and you should see their reactions and they should want to joke and talk with you. And we did have some that were like that, but sometimes we just had blank stares staring back at us, five, six, seven, ten 10 years old. And uh, that's not how a child should, should be growing up. Yeah, I think too, just thinking about the lifelong emotional impact that has on the kids that are being displaced. You know, I've heard people who were sort of displaced in a similar way when they were really young in certain countries. And now as adults, (laughs) when you ask them about their trauma history and they, you know, watched their father be taken out of out of the home and and killed. And they say to you as an adult, well, I guess you could count that as trauma. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, Jesus what do you mean? You guess you could count that as trauma. <laughs> trauma. But like, th- if you think about that, like that's what, uh, you know, that was such a huge portion of, of people's lives. And so it sort of becomes this normal thing. It gets normalized and then they move on with their lives. But like it, they have flashbacks and they have nightmares and that's an impact that is lifelong. And it's hard to think about that when you see these kids on the TV. It's also how trauma works, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, again, thinking about first responders, thinking about military, thinking about whoever's been through trauma, our brains almost block it out or normalizes it in order to f- deal with it. Mm-hmm. And guess that's trauma. Really? Just guessing. It's like when people who, you know, again, I, and, and not to discount any type of service, you know, you, you spend your time in San Diego or Colorado, but you never left stateside. You may not have the same experience as people maybe who have been, like we talked about Bosnia, we can talk about Somalia, we can talk about, I, I can talk about 40 different places. I mean, I, I remember some Panama stuff from a couple of my clients too. That, you know, we 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 minimize with like, oh, I guess I just did my job. I, I don't know again how many times I have to say to people, I don't think you so you you signed up for this shit. You you signed up to kind of like defend your country, you care for your country, and that can so it's such a different situation because I think about what, what you know going back a little bit to Bosnia is quote in peace. But really, there's still a lot of tensions down there. And, you know, the unfinished business that goes with that is just sometimes so difficult for our military personnel and the people who live through it. And, you know, you tell you, it's so difficult. Yeah, especially, obviously, we want to jump on to, uh, you know, maybe even Afghanistan and other other things. But in Bosnia, the, the land carve and the land grab and how things were set up, just that alone, thinking that the displacement and you, you transfer that into current times. It's like, okay, great. 1.5, whatever the, the amount of refugees crossing the border are, where do they go from here? Great. They're safe in Poland. All, all you hear is reports of the Polish people being unbelievably hospitable, but, but where do they go from here? Uh, you see a lot on television. Do you believe stuff? Do you not believe stuff in war? 
You have psyops, uh, psychological operations. Obviously, we have reporters there. There's cameras there. But even lately, we see some things. Um, did this happen? Didn't it happen? Now this happened. And you know, it's a back and forth. But it's actually the the boots on the ground, for example, in, in Afghanistan that's that see the things. For example, like you brought up Somalia. I have friends out in Somalia, and they uh, they've had jokes with me about, well, don't call that a loss, don't call it a tie. And it's sad to think that way, but they were through a lot. They were there for one mission, and and it, it went awry. It's and when this started in Ukraine, I remember saying to my wife, I said, this is going to get bad really really quickly. And she didn't question me on it, but asked me why. And I said, because when you're defending your home, you know where to go and you know how you can, how you can sneak up on someone. And the only way this could go is into hand-to-hand combat and guerrilla warfare in the streets. With that, on the psychological side, you've got women, children, and elders leaving on trains, and you've got their fathers and grandfathers, brothers staying behind to fight. That's another psychological toll taken not only on the children, but also on their loved ones that are that are fleeing out of the country. Where do they come back to? Do they have a place to come back to? Where do they settle? Just imagine right now you having to leave your house with one thing in this cold weather. Where do you go? What do you do? And listening to some stories about people leaving with the bare minimum, but their ID in case something happens to them so that they can identify the body. It's kind of like a very dark thought process to think that, you know, better carry your ID in case they find you, at least they'll know who's dead and who's alive. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, Caitlin, if that's something that has struck you in any way with how people feel overall. But I think that even, I don't want to deviate too much about the military personnel, but I think that there's a lot of people watching it who also seems it, it's sad because it's great that we have more coverage, but it's almost like now we're watching Big Brother instead of a real war. Yeah. And I see that a lot in my clients who are not experienced with the military experience and all that. So I, I think that it's kind of weird. I don't know if you get that, but. Yeah, absolutely. I think on a couple of levels, this is impacting people who are not, not veterans, don't have military experience for a couple of reasons. One, the last two years, like this two years this week, right? It was like when we shut down (laughs) for COVID. Um, And so like the last two years have been kind of like this bizarre, like, I don't even know what, like that people have struggled so much with the psychological impact of the illness, of the lockdown, of the mask wearing, of the social distancing and isolation. And then like, you know, we're sort of feeling like, okay, maybe we're coming out of this pandemic, like, mask mandates are being taken away. Like, you know, most people are vaccinated, whatever. And then, okay. But now like, (laughs) now we're watching this war unfold and are we going to end up in world war three? Like people have fears about that. And I do think the coverage is, plays a part as well. I think about like, you know, all the people all over the world that ended up with depression and and anxiety after 9-11 because it was all over the TV, like the same images of people jumping out of the Twin Towers and the towers crumbling. And it it was like on repeat on all the news channels and people, the exposure to that was obviously not direct, but to have those images be playing and playing people, I mean, that that messed up people psychologically that didn't even live in the U.S. because of of how the coverage, the media coverage was. And I think that we're at risk of that happening with this as well, because the coverage is pretty intense. You have the, plus we have access now to like live cams. My fiance is into live cams all over the place. I mean, they have them everywhere now. And so you can like Google live cam in Kiev and it like, bring stuff up and you can see things happening and um, explosions going off. And so there's just a lot more access to the visual, which is in some way can be helpful for people who don't have that military background to really understand the severity. But at some point, the prolonged exposure to that is can be damaging. From my perspective, the hard part is that you have this 
fake notion that someone's going to win. No one wins. You know, I hate this because, you know, like I grew up in Quebec and born and raised and people in Quebec know about the app in 1941, where the English and the Americans knew that they were going to be set up to be shot from the, the, the beaches. And uh, mostly it was a big round of Quebecers that ended up going to war there and getting shot from the top. So when we won in Quebec, we didn't feel we won anything. And I think that that's the other thing that I'm a little concerned about because people are like, oh, we can win this and we have numbers and no one wins. No one's going to ever win this. No one. And I just wanted to throw that in because, again, the history from my own country, and obviously this is my show, so I do whatever the hell I want. But number two, <laughs> number two, it, it really is something that for me, like Dieppe is completely wiped out of most history books, except in Quebec, where we're yeah. like, uh, yeah, can we remember this? So just wanted to throw that out. You were going to say, Jay, I apologize. And you just brought up something good. Uh, I got my initial thing, which is fine, but you just brought up something. No one's going to win. The, the absolute destruction uh, alone, if it was to end right now at this second, these cities are, are leveled. There is no moving back. And I know I said that a few minutes ago, but like you said, there is no moving back. There are no winners. Uh, one thing I want to say, especially along mental health, uh, it may not be uh, overtly noticeable. And some people are probably going to say, Jay, I don't know why you're even bringing this up, but there are a lot of people out there that may not understand, may not like the military, may not. Uh, Obviously, you don't have to look back too far. Even though it was a long time ago, you look back to Vietnam and how the Vietnam veterans were treated when they got back. And I think it was deplorable. And I'm glad that isn't happening these days. But if you've got a veteran in your life and or you come into contact, if they say things like, geez, I'm going to go over there. Geez, I'm going to do this. Geez, I'm going to do that. They're not a warmonger. They're not killers. They're not bad people. But they're, they're struggling. They, they were given a skill set. And that skill set isn't to kill, but that skill set can't, you know, not empirical data, but the overwhelming majority, uh, that skill set, especially being a, a United States soldier, Marine, Airman, anything, is to protect people, to help those. Just like if a bully was picking on someone on the playground, I did a paper the other day on cyberbullying, and 60% of people, you know, two thirds of people think that cyberbullying should stop. Well, 60% of them, stand by and do nothing. And that's right. what you see with our, our U.S. service members. Right or wrong, whoever's right, whoever's wrong, they want to go help the person they believe is being attacked and the person they're being picked on, regardless of political affiliation, regardless of propaganda or anything along those lines. So think of that. That is, I'm not saying it's it's a mental health crisis, but that is interwoven into, into the United States military. We want to help people less fortunate. And yes, I could be countered by people that say, well, you know, we've had some unethical and, and, and evil missions over the years. Yeah, no, no doubt. Just like any other country has. But when I hear some of these guys talk to me and we, we get into little groups and we, we chat about military actions, that's, in my opinion, sometimes those men and women struggling with what's going on. Think of it. If you've never been in the military, you've never been a police officer, and you're sitting at home right now watching CNN or Fox News or whatever you're watching, MSNBC. Is your first inclination to grab a rifle, jump on a plane, and go to a foreign country? I'd probably, <laughs> I, I'd probably bet that isn't your first inclination. And I saw a stat the other day. Um, there's a lot of back and forth, and not to get off the mental health, but just to just to have how people are thinking. You know, 74. There was a poll out there, and I don't believe in totally polls, total, you know, yeah, truth in them. But 74 percent of people think we should put up a no fly zone. I would sit there with these veterans who psychologically know what will happen and how awful things will be. Mm -hmm. I sit there and I look and I just shake my head. I go, no, that's an escalation. Sometimes you get that blank stare of, of a veteran just shake. I, I, I get angry. Now, my anger, should I argue with a person that says this? No. Should I have a debate with them? I don't know. Maybe. But that's what's ingrained into my head and other veterans. I feel comfortable saying that's what other veterans think. We're not, like I started out, we're not watching what's going on TV. We're thinking of how bad it can get. Because sadly enough, it's, this is, this is, I don't want to say nothing because for a lot of people, it's everything. But our thoughts, what we know, what we've been trained and what we've seen, every veteran singling them out alone, this is just the beginning. And it's not to scare people. 
But sometimes you see that blank stare. And my wife's asked me, what do you, what's wrong? You wouldn't understand. You know, it's one of those things like, yeah. I just don't want to talk about it. So, and, and I see that a lot with guys I talk to, I check on them. Some guys that I know that have been in Fallujah, guys that have been in fights in Afghanistan, the real deal, they've, they've done it. I know what they know, what they're thinking. I know what they've done. I know what they've seen. And, and even though they're not showing it on the, uh, the outside, they're, they're inside them is, is torn up. I think that's a really like important piece of this for the veteran population, because I think that sort of inability to be able to just hop on a plane and go and protect people and, and be involved and be using that skill set that, that you have as a veteran. I think that leads to a lot of feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. And that's where, you know, we get into sort of the danger zone with suicidal ideation, self-medication, things like that, because your visceral reaction to what's happening in the news is, I want to be there. I want to, I want to be protecting people. I want to be helping. And, and you're not in a position to do that. And so, but what, what do you do? And it's bringing up all these thoughts about what you did see and what, what you were doing to help. And, and it just can get, I think can really spiral pretty quickly. And I know this is not the main conversation we have here, but never forget the families that have to stay back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have a lot of friends from my previous employment who are, you know, spouses of military personnel. And they talk about like right now being on high alert. They, this is not necessarily about, I haven't talked to them in a while, but they were talking about, you know, Afghanistan, you might be called up tomorrow. And, you know, the family has to pick up everything and the other person's going and you may be kissing them for the last time. And that's yeah. kind of scary stuff, too. And I, I think that that's what, you know, you talk about what veterans and people are feeling helpless here who know a little bit about the combat situation. Again, I don't have the ego to say that I understand it, but they, the substance abuse, the mental health crisis that that causes, and then it affects 5, 10, 20 people, depending on how big your family and your friend circle is, it does affect them a lot. And I think that that's where, you know, I want to throw that out too, because, you know, there's police personnel that I've talked to. They're like, okay, well, we got three guys who are in the reserves. What's going to happen to them? And that's the stuff that people tend to forget about how the impact of something happening away from you can affect a police department or a fire department, a family, a neighborhood, everything. So just want to throw that out too. Yeah, and and not to divert too much off, but still sticking with veterans. As you know, Steve and Caitlin definitely knows this. Um, I'm a big believer in specialty courts. I don't care if it's a, a, a drug treatment court. I could name off a whole bunch, but one being veterans treatment court. You've got some veterans that are either involved or not, and I always hear, well, why are we giving veterans a free ride? And I believe, and I think I said in a previous episode, yes, they're not get, yeah, they're not getting a free ride. Some of the treatment they do, I think, it'll be much easier just to go to regular court and get through the process, or go but, to jail. Um, frankly, sometimes go, go, go to jail. Yeah, I mean, it could, but these veterans are working through uh, their issues. A lot of them are younger. Um, we see a lot of domestics. Uh, a lot of, and it's it's sad to say, we see some firearms charges, but these firearms charges are stem from maybe them self-medicating, as Caitlin said, being intoxicated or a noise complaint. Next thing you know, a gun's left out in the open and they're picking up a gun charge. Am I condoning them having guns while they're intoxicated? Absolutely not. But obviously there's a precursor, precursor to their, their, their trauma. A lot of the guys that we deal with in veterans court have, have a lot of trauma from their, from their service in the military. So I just wanted to reiterate that part, you know, we may have veterans that uh, commit crimes, but a lot of it uh, needs to move into something like treatment-based veterans court. And I'm not just single veterans. I believe in all specialty courts, but just reinforcing that fact. I think one of the things that just sort of popped into my head was like, you talking about trauma, Jay. And like, what well, I think one of the big reasons that this is so hard for people who have served in a military capacity is that this whole thing with Russia and Ukraine is a huge trigger. Like we try to, I try not to talk about, you know, people get triggered by all kinds of things these days, but this is a huge trigger for Trump, people with, with military trauma. 
it just is. Um, and that's, you know, can bring up all kinds of things. It can bring people back to flashbacks and nightmares and hypervigilance and, you know, all those sort of symptoms of, of post-traumatic stress can be triggered by, by what's happening in the news. And so I think that is really a, an important thing to keep in mind. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's so many things that both of you said that are so important. I mean, I've been with a veteran where they hear, you know, a garbage container top fall on top, you know, when they close it and they get triggered by that sound because it does sound very difficult for some people. I've worked with veterans who that they, they have a gun. You talk about the gun. It's not about the gun for me. It's about what made you take out the gun. What, what has, you know, obviously I've started a couple of recovery courts in, in Massachusetts and the, you know, gun charges do come up and I'm like, well, yeah, that's lack of judgment because of substances or trauma or stuff like that. So that's not just like, like, I know, you know, we got to be black and white sometimes in law enforcement and I get it, but sometimes that gun charge is nothing compared to the other stuff that goes with that. And that's where you got like the, my favorite judge who works in a recovery court in Worcester always said, there's a difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And you need to remember <laughs> that there's a huge difference between the two. I, I got to not to divert too much, but I got to look the other day from a defense attorney in a staffing meeting. I said, is that a real gun charge or a fake gun charge? And they, they gave me this crazy look, but exactly what you said, Steve, you know, this firearm was in some cases they're found during another incident and not being actively used. And yes, a dangerous situation regardless, but um, it's, you know, exactly what you, <laughs> that judge friend of yours said. Yeah, well, I, I think that that's why like a little bit of what's going on right now, you know, we talk about Ukraine, we talk about Russia, we talk about how it's affecting the vets. We need to understand that we're, we, I'm, I'm done with the social media uh, warriors who know everything <laughs> about what's going on in Ukraine and Russia and the vaccine and whatever else you want to talk about. They, they also know about my, you know, my possible issues with fatigue. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. You, you don't know nothing. And I think that what I really want to come back to is how do we help veterans? We talk about the drug courts, which is one aspect. But right now, there's several other aspects, whether veterans, inactive military, active military. There's a lot of different people who are very much affected by this. And obviously, veterans, I'm not trying to dismiss them. How do we help them? And I, I ask that to both of you. Caitlin's going to have a much more educated answer than me. So I'm going to start so she can just like brush me up one with veterans to start, talk to them, call them. Yeah. Guess what? You're going to run to a snow wall with veterans. Sometimes they're not going to tell you what's wrong with them. They're just going to move on. Never but, noticed. But, <laughs> but, but remember on the side though, they're probably going to talk to the brothers and sisters on that end. So don't lose all help, hope. Check in on them. As for others, like I said, I'm going to defer to you and Caitlin, the professionals in this. As for others, help them through it. Uh, my problem is when this first started, I, for lack of a better term, exploded. Like I said, you know a lot what's going on. You know what can happen, what potential there is to happen. And you say things that you probably shouldn't say around people that are just trying to get through their normal day. And you bleed over your thoughts and your concerns onto other people and make them more scared. That's something that, that can affect their, their psyche also, in my opinion. Um, I'll stop there because I know that uh, Caitlin's going to have something much more technical <laughs> to explain. I mean, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's more technical. I think you're right. I think if you have veterans no or <laughs> if you have veterans or active military people in your life, like, yeah, check in on them, reach out. How are you doing? how are you handling things? And, and maybe they say they're fine and that's great. And maybe you check in again in another week because we all know that. I got to stop you for a second. How many veterans have you checked in that weren't fine? What do you mean? What? My experience <laughs> is every veteran I spoke to is like, oh, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm good. They never oh. really open up right away. They sit in my office for 60 minutes and then suddenly there's shit going down. But before that, if I call them or text them, they're like, ah, everything's great. I'm good. I think it depends. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, it depends. I've ha I have checked in with people and had them be like, not good. Then that's okay. Well, then we, you know, then we deal with it from there. Um, but yeah, it's not a common experience. But, you know, like you said, like they're going to, 
oftentimes just say they're fine all the time and maybe maybe they are but maybe they're not and so continue sort of continually not every day necessarily but like give it a week and check in again because things change drastically over the course of a week especially in a situation like this and so I think that's helpful I also think you know if if you do know a veteran or an active military member who's struggling and they are looking to to get help you know making sure you point them in the right direction for that help because like we've talked about with first responders in general not every therapist is prepared to cope with that um with that you know with somebody sitting in their office talking about the war trauma that they have from years ago or whatever so you know making sure that the place that we're sending them for help is an appropriate place is important and and just knowing that like letting people know too that that we support the veterans, whether that's with a social media post or a donation to a military organization, um, you know, just, I think sometimes that support gets lost in the shuffle. And I think that can be important too. And I was joking, of course, some veterans are very honest, but you know, part of Jay laughs. So he knows exactly what I mean by that. (laughs) One of the ways I've found personally to do is if I ask a vet how he's doing I, and they say good, which is the standard bullshit answer. Um, <laughs> I always say, well, how's, how's your wife dealing with this? Or how's your partner dealing with this? Or how's your kids? Now suddenly they had their, they're affected, not the veteran. So I take that information and kind of like, oh, so none of that is affecting you. And usually I could get the conversation going usually. So that's the other advice I have is that if someone's kind of closed down for their own reasons, obviously, because as a, I've never, Obviously, we we talked this about talked about this in another episode. I've never asked for a story from Jay. You know, I never will ask you for a story ever, and so you don't necessarily want to do that. But in the presence as a friend, as a family member, sometimes it's getting to talk about other people that they care about, how it's affecting them, in order for them to open up about their own stuff. And so that's why I joke around about you know the standard answer. But please, whoever is a veteran and is very offended by my answer, I'm okay with that. So I think that the other part that I wanted to kind of like discuss a little bit is, is there a way to help veterans heal? Because I know it's a simple, it's a very complex answer, obviously. I'm not that dumb, but how do we help them? Because this is not, it's triggering for the population. I think that triggering also the simplistic view of sometimes who people who haven't served or people who don't know about war and reading Sun Z in The Art of War is not being in action whatsoever, as one of my clients has pointed out. How do we help them heal at least, at least a little bit? Because the reality is, is that you're absolutely right, Jay. I, it's not going to end in Ukraine. It's not, that's not, I, I don't, it, my own personal opinion is that it, this is just a start. And so how do we help heal in these very troubled times for them? Well, one thing that I look and it's a, it's a bad analogy, but get a Volkswagen, take the <laughs> tires, take the tires off of it, hook a chain up to it, and tell the you know person to pull it because that's what it's like getting. Uh, and I'm not speaking for all veterans, but that's what it's like to get a veteran. Uh, sometimes first responders into therapy, as both of you know, because that's your specialty. But once you get them in there, it takes a while, but they they open up. Maybe they disappear for a while. Maybe they come back. But it's incumbent upon anyone listening right now, first responder, and I'm not, like I said, no dis- disrespect to anyone that's not a first responder, not a veteran, but obviously the show is singled upon them. It's a comment upon those who have been to therapy, who have talked to someone, maybe it's just talking to someone, to let them know it's not a place to be afraid. I know a lot of things come out of, oh my God, I'm going to get sectioned. Oh no, you're not going to get sectioned. Oh my God, they're going to think I'm crazy. No, they're not going to think you're crazy. I can't believe I'm, I'm weak. Well, throw the weak thing out because I don't want to hear that anymore. You need help. You need to talk to someone. There are people that specialize out there. Caitlin, Stephen, for example, there are veterans who are clinicians. There are police officers who are clinicians. So what I, what I'm saying to people who are struggling or not struggling and, and, don't want to go to therapy, reach out to someone who has. Listen to the people that have. If you have gone to therapy, if you have talked to someone, if uh, you just do it to decompress, encourage those struggling. If you see that stare, veterans know that stare. Clinicians know that stare. You see that stare. You're at home. You see the outbursts. I don't say dance around it, but 
you know, let's encourage each other because no one thinks you're any less of a person, any, any less tough because you're going to go talk to someone. I, I bring up, and Caitlin knows this, she must be annoyed with it by now. If I was to drop of a heart attack right now, you're going to help me with the heart attack. If I, uh, if I have a problem psychologically, why do we stare at people and think they're less of a human being? Okay. So help, help each other. You know, encourage others to go get help. It may take a while. I know there's a good friend of mine that every time I talk to him, I feel like he hates me about going. He disregards it, but I know he hasn't told me yet, but I know he went because <laughs> just by the way he talked to me one day. So you may not know it, but what you do to encourage people may have a profound effect. Yeah, I think too, uh, there is, we say this in, in mental health first aid too, like there is hope for recovery. Like you want to give people that. People can recover from severe trauma and severe post-traumatic stress. There's all kinds of treatments out there to help with, with trauma. There's EMDR and transcranial magnetic stimulation is one of the newer ones that is out there for, for that kind of stuff. And I think there is treatment for it. And with that though, like, yes, I think you can heal, you can heal people's trauma, but that doesn't mean that that wound won't get that open back up again. You know, um, I think with all, you know, depression, bipolar, whatever anybody's diagnosis might be, you can go to therapy and you can get treatment and you can take medication and you can get to a point where you're, you're managing it and you're doing, you're functioning well. And, and you're healed, right? Like you've recovered, but then maybe something happens. You some, you know, a loved one dies in a traumatic car accident or, you know, for veterans like this, maybe there are veterans, I'm sure that, that there are veterans out there that have had gotten to a place of healing their trauma. And then this Ukraine thing comes up and it sort of rips that wound back open. And so then it's another process of taking care of yourself and, and going back to therapy and, and getting getting healed again, which again, like Jay said, with the heart attack thing, like that's what you do. If, if you get a cold, you, you rest, you take care of yourself, you heal. Are you never going to get a cold again in your life? Probably you are. And so you have to go through the same thing again, but it's, a, it's always healing, I think is always a possibility. And recovery is always something that I think people should have hope for. And I think that I go back to one of the analogies that Jay has used before, like anything from the neck down, that's okay. We can talk about it. That's wide open. Whatever's up neck up. Well, well, I'm not dealing with that. I mean, I, I, I joke around that if someone had like a big mark on their face, you will not mention that because oh my God, I can't mention that. (laughs) But if they have it on their arm, like, Hey, what the hell is that? And so I think that that's the stuff that I talk about about me being okay. And I use your analogy in another podcast and I gave you credit for it, Jay. So just for the record, um, <laughs> the, the, the thing that I, I, I want to go back to what you said, Jay, just because it's true. And most of my clients laugh about it. So uh, starting in January, I have a, a little board in my wall in my office and it says F you on it. And people ask me, what does that stand for? I said, well, when I really get my clients, particularly my first responders and my military personnel, they sometimes look at me and go, you. And, I'm, and to me, that's the ultimate compliment. And, and people always laugh. They're like, really? That's, that seems like mean. I'm like, no, that means they respect you. That means they, 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 you got them. And so if the insurance company is listening, it's F dash U. So follow up. It's, that's what I need to do. The rest, the rest of you are real. Uh, it, it, it is what it is. And I think that for me as a therapist, what I found is to be okay with kind of pressing stuff. And I'm not very scared of that. I will push people. And if they piss, they're pissed off a little bit for a short while, 90% of them come back and say, thank you for pissing me off. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. The other thing that I want to mention too, is that, you know, we talked about trauma. I'm an EMBR guy. I've done EMBR for years. I tell people trauma, you don't, you don't, yeah, I hate the heal word of trauma because you know, you get, you get through it. You never get over it and it never disappears. So yeah, it will be triggered again. And I don't care how good my EMDR is. There's going to be some things. And for the military personnel that I've worked with, these things are triggering. So let's not play games that we heal from trauma. I've never healed anyone from depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, trauma. I've helped them get through it. And sometimes they get re-triggered and that's life. That includes my own mental health. I've had my own stuff in my life and I sometimes need to go back to work at it. So just want to throw that out too. Just uh, one thing I know we're probably getting close to, to wrapping up, but 
this episode is about veterans, absolutely. But check on your neighbors. This is a time that maybe some of our people older than all of us think back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. This has an effect on everyone. Yes, that we focus on veterans, but let's check on our neighbors. People are sitting by the television watching every single minute of that. Yes, they're not in Kiev. No, they're not in Ukraine. No, they're not in uh, Eastern Europe. But people are watching this as if it was a miniseries. I'm not saying they're discarding that this is real life, but check on your neighbors. Check on your veteran friends. Like Steve said, you're probably going to get the F you. Probably going to get, like I say, people, I'm good. There's a great video out there. It's, I'm good. Well, you're not good. Check on your friends. Check on your military members, okay? Uh, that's That's just one thing I want to put out there. Let's not anyone be sitting around stewing on this 24 seven. The news hasn't stopped. It, it has a profound effect on everyone, not just people who are in the military or currently in the military. One of the things I also would mention if you're checking on neighbors, people, whoever you check on, doesn't matter who you check on. One of my uh, tricks that I tell people is if you say the same word three times, they're lying. And what I mean by that, oh, are you good? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That means they're lying. They're not good. <laughs> and I tell people that that's a trick to kind of like note and everyone, you both laugh because you know, I'm right. And I always tell people if they say the same thing three times or more, they're not meaning it. And it's okay not to press someone. And maybe you don't get a fuck you. You make, you get a silence or whatever. Say, hey, can I check back on you later on? And I think that's a great idea. Any closing thoughts from you, Caitlin? Oh, I just, I think all of what you guys just said are, is really relevant. I think, you know, I um, do outpatient groups and it, it is impacting everyone, not just people who are in the military. I think that's really a valid point. People with anxiety are reading the news and feeling anxious about, about all of it, about, you know, the nuclear threats and the, you know, the economic impact and the, all, you know, all, just all of it. People get anxious about, about things like this. And so I think it is having an impact on everyone, especially the veterans. Um, just be mindful of that when you're talking to people about it. And I think that's, that's all. I'm going to, I'm going to finish off with another couple of things that I would, I say to, I've said to my clients for about ever, but recently in two weeks, I've said a lot, spend 10 minutes watching the news in the morning, watch the news 10 minutes at night. That's it. You don't, you're not going to miss anything, nothing right. major. And if there's something major, you're going to hear it in the morning. You're going to hear it at night. It's not like that news is going to you, like, you're breaking it. You're not, you're not MSNBC. You're not Fox news. You, you, you're just some schmo listening to the mu- news. So get away from that, get away from your phone. And the, and again, I'm going to sound a little bit of uh, a softy here, but I'm fine with that. Let's stop talking about this divisions over politics and human beings and stuff like that. I don't, I don't care what your, I don't care what your political stance are. I don't care what your race is. I don't care what your gender is or gender identity, whatever that is. To me, we're humans, and you know the commonality of being a human being and being affected by people who are crossing the border at Poland, going through the disturbing images that if you've never been in combat, seeing things on TV that. Can't believe we're putting that on. Go back to the Viet Cong at this point, for Christ's sake. But, and I think that that's where you also kind of like have to start thinking about how we're going to treat each other in the long term. Because most people know I'm a bleeding heart liberal from Canada who is not American. Yet I've never met someone who believes in conservative views that I didn't love in some way. And I know I sound like a peace and love type of guy here. I don't really care because they're just a human with an opinion. You know, if they they pulled a gun on me and they said, you got to believe what I believe, maybe I'd have a different point of view, but no one's ever point, pulled a gun on me. No one's pulled a weapon on me. We've had disagreements. I wear my Montreal Canadiens jersey at Boston Bruins games. And I get crap for it. But uh, at the end of the day, we're all humans. And I know I sound a little peace and love and I'm a little teary thinking about that. But let's let's take this as an opportunity to see it as a human issue, not just a Ukrainian, Russian white, black, she, her, them. And I'm not trying to point any particular, but you know what I mean? I'm I'm a Canadian who would fight for this country in two seconds. I would fight for Canada in two seconds, but it's because they're humans and I love them and we need to remember that. So sorry, Jay, I went a little soft on you there. (laughs) No worries. 
So I want to thank you again for this great episode. I think this was impactful. I think Caitlin's the only one who didn't cry. Uh, good for you. <laughs> Jeez, um, yeah, I can't remember that far back now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, memorialized forever. <laughs> and um, I, I do hope that this helps some people, not only first responders, veterans, but also you people who listen to this podcast, because I think there's a lot of therapeutics and mental health stuff that comes from this. And I want to thank you for your time. And season five is going to be right around the corner again. And uh, you know, you're both invited again. Thanks right, for having us, Steve. Hopefully I won't sleep through it. <sighs> hey, I did mention it once. I did not mention it once. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> and here we are. I had to. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You, you can get the show notes and I'll explain that one. All right. Thanks, <laughs> thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, wow. Very apropos subject. Very heavy stuff. Very difficult stuff. We tried to touch a whole lot of different things. I didn't know where I was going to go, but, you know, thank you, Jay, for opening up about your experience being in Bosnia. It's, it's very generous of you to open up about that. Caitlin, your insight with your current work and also your history of working with first respond. I, I can't tell you. Thank you enough. You know, the feeling helpless, the families, what it has triggered in other people, the past traumas, current traumas. I know I finished off a little philosophical, the episode, but yeah, that was something. So I, I really am hoping you guys give me a lot of feedback on this because uh, to me, it was probably such an important topic, but more importantly, just, just very difficult. And I think that we're not trying to be political here, just a very difficult subject to talk about veterans and how it affects them when there is war essentially on live TV at this point. Episode 41 is with Rachel Chatham. Rachel is a therapist, and she responded to a message I had said that I want to talk about people's experiences in therapy, and she was more than happy to do so. She's a licensed clinical mental health counselor in Asheville, North Carolina, and she practices Buddhist psychology, traumatic stress, and schema therapy. And we'll talk a lot about different things on that subject, and I can't wait to hear about her experience as a therapist, as well as, a, but we're going to talk also about the experience of clients in therapy, and I'm very excited about that. So I will see you then. Please like, subscribe, or follow this podcast on your favorite platform. A glowing review is always helpful. And as a reminder, this podcast is for information, educational, and entertainment purposes. If you're struggling with a mental health or substance abuse issue, please reach out to a professional counselor or therapist for consultation.